Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and today, yay, we're finally looking at the Google Nexus 4 smartphone. This is Google's latest pure Google experience device. It's sold on lock, GSM networks only, and uh, there's a lot of improvements here over the last Nexus, the Galaxy Nexus. The hardware inside is actually pretty impressive. Quad-core 1.5 gigahertz CPU, a very good 8 megapixel camera, HSPA Plus 4G, so GSM networks only for this. 299 for 8 gigs, 349 for 16 gigs. Not bad compared to what carriers charge for phones. We're going to look at it now. So here it is, the Nexus 4. This is a Google official phone. It is made by LG. A lot in common with the Optimus G. A lot of the internals are based on the Optimus G, and it's just about the same size. It just has the typical Nexus curvy design language. Instead, makes it look a little bit like the Galaxy Nexus. That was the last Nexus phone made by Samsung. But we have some differences here. 4.7 inch display, IPS, yay, no AMOLED display here, no pentile matrix, high pixel density, 4.7 inches, running at 1280 by 768 for 320 ppi pixel density, that's right up there in the same league as the Nokia Lumia 920 and the iPhone 5, good stuff, very sharp, very nice display, good colors too, uh, it can even show maroony, dark red colors pretty well without looking too bright or orangey, that kind of thing. Reasonably bright, but plenty of glare on this display. Very shiny Gorilla Glass 2 display. The digitizer is fused to the glass here, so you have the, the feeling that the text is really painted on, kind of nice, like the HTC One X and the iPhone 5 there. But still plenty of glare. And it has a curved glass display. It curves down on the sides, much like the HTC One X, which looks cool, and Google says it's easier when you're swiping your finger sideways, the way it feels. I just like the way it looks. I have not had any problem with Link getting stuck in there. But again, that all conspires to add plenty of, well, glare. And if we look on the back, speaking of glass and glare, this is a glass back. Optimus G also had a glass back. This one looks, well, even more glassy. And one thing that's hard to see here, I'm going to try to shine this to get the pattern to come out, but it's really just turning into a mirror. There is a subtle pattern that you'll see only when you turn it at certain angles in the light. And it's kind of a neat little small dot pattern. Subtle, obviously. Can't even manage to bring it out right now, but makes for an interesting looking device. Also makes for a more delicate device, so be careful with this. You've got glass on two sides, and as we've learned from the iPhone 4 or 4S, glass is a delicate thing, isn't it? The sides, however, are pretty much rubbery hard plastic, so that will absorb impacts, and that's a good thing. And, well, the sides actually look a lot less sexy than the front and the back of the phone as a result, too. If you take a look here, we've got our volume rocker, a little chrome surround going around. Give a little visual interest. We've got our micro SIM card slot in here. There we've got our micro USB port with a microphone hole. Two teeny weeny little screws that hold the thing together because this is a unibody design so you can't yank the back off to get at the 2100 milliamp battery that's inside. And there's our power button over here. And up top we've got another microphone hole and the 3.5 millimeter audio jack. Front 1.3 megapixel camera, rear 8 megapixel camera with very bright LED flash. And there's our speaker grill right there. For a pretty big phone, 4.7 inches, it, it's pretty easy to hold. The curves do help about the same size as the Samsung Galaxy S3. We'll compare that right now. And here it is next to the Galaxy S3 in red, the AT&T version. About the same size. Pretty close in thickness as well. They're both very slim phones, 0.36 inches for the Nexus 4. And here it is on top of the fairly ginormous Samsung Galaxy Note with a 5.5 inch display. So suddenly the, the Nexus 4 is looking pretty darn portable when you compare it to something like the Galaxy Note. There they are, side by side. In the spirit of pure Android design, there are no capacitive buttons here. These are actually software buttons that you're seeing on screen, so they will use up a little bit of your screen real estate. And the phone is running Android Jelly Bean 4.2. Now both 4.1 and 4.2 are called Jelly Bean. 4.2 is currently the latest, and you'll find that just on Nexus devices right now. And that adds a couple of tweaks and features, things like pinch, zooming, and Gmail, and separate user accounts on tablets, but not on the smartphone. And there's a couple of other neat things just in general about Jelly Bean that we'll show you with the latest version here. But first let's talk about the hardware inside. 1.5 GHz Qualcomm Snapdragon S4 Pro Crate CPU. The Pro means it is a quad-core CPU, so this thing is pretty fast. In fact, that's the same internals in the Optimus G by LG. 
and also in the HTC Droid DNA. However, it benchmarks slower than those other two. That's really surprising. So far in synthetic benchmarks, you would think this would do at least as well as the Optimus G, or maybe a little better because it has a, a clean Android experience, no overlay on top, and slightly newer version of the operating system, but it benchmarks a little slow. We'll cover those numbers in a bit. 2 gigs of RAM in here, so you've got plenty of memory for multitasking, and again, it's available with either 8 or 16 gigs of storage. 8 sounds a little old-fashioned these days, doesn't it? But that allows them to bring it in at a $299 price point without contract. $349 if you want the 16 gig. So this guy, this is a GSM world phone, so this is not going to work on Sprint, this is not going to work on Verizon. Uh, Google has not said that they're going to have a version for each of the, either of those carriers. It does not have LTE. For those of us in the U.S., that is pretty much a bummer. Really, it depends on how good your HSPA Plus service is from your carrier in your area. Um, T-Mobile is actually selling this with contract for $199, so you get a little bit of savings there, but that's not really a huge subsidy. I would say just, if you can afford it, don't even bother with the contract on T-Mobile. But since they don't have LTE, they have a pretty robust HSPA Plus 42 network, and it makes the most sense there. On AT&T, again, they pay more attention to, to making LTE as fast as possible rather than HSPA, HSPA Plus. So a little bit less exciting if you spend a lot of time surfing web pages, streaming video, that kind of thing. Now for those of you who are overseas, um, many countries still don't have LTE and then, well, it's a no-brainer. This, this is, becomes a much more attractive phone. Phone has dual band Wi-Fi, 802.11bgn, Bluetooth, a GPS, and NFC that works with Google Wallet. Of course, since it's an official Google phone, you don't have to worry about any problems using Google Wallet there. Clean experience device, nothing on here except for what you download in the standard Google applications. We download a bunch of benchmarking apps. We have the Dead Trigger game on here. And other than that, you have your Google Plus, your Google Movie Studio, Maps, Navigation, Google Chrome is the web browser for Jelly Bean. That's what you get. Google Play Magazine, Google Play Books, Google Play Movies, Google Play Music. You get the idea. YouTube player, Google Wallet. If you want an Office suite, you got to go by and download one yourself, or you just want Office Viewer, you can find perhaps a, a free Office Viewer. Uh, nothing else has been added on here by any carrier or anybody else, so just a very basic experience here. So you can hit the Google Play Store and load this up with the apps of your choice instead of having the carrier or the manufacturer pick them for you. The dialer is big, bold, and basic. Here it is. Boy, anybody could tap those numbers. They're so big, right? And these little subtle icons up here, this means using your dialer. This takes you to call history up here, and this one will take you to your contacts. And the little dot dot menu thing shows you that there are settings available. That's the new way to do settings in Android. And then we have our various settings that are available. Some of the neat things that come with Jelly Bean, we have Google Now, and this is actually pretty neat. I was out driving with this phone and took it out, and Google Now just decided to launch when I turned it on. I thought, hmm, why? And it was showing me that it was no, I was nine minutes away from home, that there was light traffic on the highway on the way to get home, and it showed me a map. So that's pretty useful. Now I have my Nexus 7, which is obviously also running the same operating system, but I don't take my tablet everywhere with me, so... This is useful. Now, if I want to get to Google Now at any time, press and hold on the home button and then slide up. You have to keep your finger down on the screen and then there's Google Now. Which will give me handy things like weather. It explains what, how, what cards work. If I want to add cards right now, it's not giving me directions because it knows that I am home. You could have uh, eateries in your area, movie theater show times, things like that show up. And we've got our voice search here which supports more commands than ever and actually works pretty well. What is Google's stock price? Google is up 0.23% to 671 US dollars and 52 cents in after hours trading. Look at Siri, they're chasing after you pretty fast, aren't they? That's not bad. Also, if we're in the lock screen, you can now have widgets on your lock screen. Now this could pose perhaps a security issue depending on what information and widgets you choose to have up there, but for most of us who are not James Bond, we don't worry too much about that. Grab and hold, there's my calendar. And even though it's locked, look, I want to add another widget right here, so I can just pick one. I'll put my Gmail. We already have the digital clock. And choosing inbox. So then I get that. That's a little, it takes a good bit of effort to swipe between these guys. And there's also the camera there as a widget, so no need to actually unlock it. Though I do find it a little fiddly, the lock screen, to, to swipe between these things. And while we're in the camera, let's take a look at it, because this is a pretty bizarre new camera interface. And we'll pull out our favorite little toy to take a picture of. 
So here we are on the camera interface, and this is pretty minimal control of the flash here. By the way, very bright flash. This is not the greatest camera for super low light photography, but that flash will really help to illuminate a room. But you don't want to use it when you're very close to your subject, like we are right now, because it'll actually white it out. So here we can switch between panorama mode, the new all the way around panorama mode, where you, just, you don't just shoot several side shots side to side, but up and down to make it just an even bigger image. And you can switch to your video camera. We're going to leave it right now in camera mode. So if you want to get to more settings, you press and hold. Not to be confused with tap to focus, which we have right here. But if you tap and hold that little circle, you see all these little options come up. And you have to keep your finger down and slide to them. You can choose HDR mode, which works pretty well. And you can get to your EV settings, plus and minus. More settings, auto white balance. Still not a whole lot of settings here. This, the, compared to, say, Samsung Galaxy cameras, this is a little bit simplistic, but it's better than nothing. Shot times are very quick, and if we want to switch to video, we can shoot 1080p video, and again, if we want to get to settings, and we'll switch from 720p up to 1080p, and we're going to start recording. So now here we are shooting a video, and if we want to take a picture, we just tap anywhere on the screen and it silently takes a picture. It flashes the screen just a little bit so you know that it's happening. So that's the camera. Camera quality on this, it's good. It's quite good. I would say that it's about neck and neck with the Samsung Galaxy S3. For low light Galaxy S3 wins, I like the HDR a little bit better on this phone, however, which takes multiple exposures to try to get something that's not suffering from underexposure and overexposure at the same time. 1080p video recording is also nice and sharp on it, so definitely an improvement from the last phone, the Galaxy Nexus, which had only a 5 megapixel camera. It was a bit of a disappointment. It was a little slow. This guy is fast. Does a nice job. Now how about speed test? We actually have this phone with a T-Mobile SIM inside, which makes the most sense again because they don't have an LTE network, so HSPA plus 42 megabit per second is the fastest you're going to get on T-Mobile, and it's not so bad. We'll run a speed test live right now after we turn off our Wi-Fi, and that gets into one of the neat new features here. If you swipe down, you get your notifications. That's nothing new with an Android phone. Tap there to clear them. But see this little symbol right here in the corner? If you tap that, finally, quick access to settings. That's something I always miss on vanilla Android phones, because most manufacturers offer customization, so you have some sort of quick access to things like, well, your brightness, all settings, your Wi-Fi, airplane mode, Bluetooth, location, battery stats. So we're going to turn off our Wi-Fi before we run our speed test. It's a nice little touch there. And we have a pretty decent signal here right now. I'm full bars. We just did pop to full bars. By the way, the indicator says 3G because Google, like Apple, knows that well, HSPA Plus technically is still really a 3G technology even though it's marketed as 4G by T-Mobile and AT&T in the US. So even though we are on HSPA Plus, which would show up as 4G on a T-Mobile branded phone, it's still on HSPA Plus here. And you can see those are pretty darn good speeds. It's actually fairly competitive with LTE on T-Mobile. They do a real good job in our area. Now with AT&T on the same phone, we were getting more like 5.5 to 6 megabit per second down. So not as stunning nearly as their LTE network that tends to average around 25 megabit per second down. And for our results, you can see that in general it did pretty well down here. Don't know what went wrong once in a while, you just don't get a very good connection. But overall, decent range of speeds there. T-Mobile does cap their upload speeds, that's why the upload speeds are so much lower than the download speeds. Call quality on the phone is really good. Nice, loud, sharp, clear through the earpiece, and both incoming and outgoing voice actually sounds very nice. The loudspeaker on it, not super duper loud. We'll try some audio stuff so you can hear that. We've got our group will play music going. We're almost at maximum volume. This is very tinny and not very loud. Don't know what up with that. And while we're testing multimedia, we'll go for some video playback and test a 1080p video to see how that goes. And you can hear that audio typically on movie trailers is pretty loud, so it's going to sound a bit better. So we'll test out our 1080p trailer. 
still nearly max volume. Nice IPS display. Once again, I really like this over the, the Galaxy Nexus screen. Much more accurate colors. But for those of you who've gotten used to the super saturated, super AMOLED colors, you might miss it. Higher subpixel density here too. Plays perfectly. Good. Sharp video. Now one thing to note, obviously this is a 720p-ish screen, it's actually 768 rather than 720p pixels, but if you want to do output to HDMI, what we have here is called a slim HDMI connector. You might think that that's a new word for MHL, no sadly it's not. So you're going to have to find one of those adapters, they run about 30 bucks, they're not too easy to find if you want to actually output to a TV. Why or oh, why they did that, I don't know. Your pre-installed web browser is Chrome. Of course, you can download third-party web browsers if you like. And there's our Sun Spider test right there, the last thing that we ran. And you can see we have 1854 for our result. That's not super impressive. That's about as well as Qualcomm dual-core uh, S4 CPU phones have been doing. Certainly not as fast as the iPhone, iPhone 5 that did 922 milliseconds, where lower numbers are better, and the Lumia did 911, and even the Optimus G was down there in the 1200s. Uh, pretty odd, surprising. Project Butter is not feeling too slippery, I guess, in 4.2 at the moment. But we'll visit our own website, you can see the default keyboard here. By the way, Google has added swipe-like gestures, poor swipe, so you can actually drag along if you want to, if you're into that kind of input. And here we're loading our own website again over at T-Mobile's HSPA Plus network. Loads pretty quickly. Not bad. Zoom is pretty smooth, fairly controlled. Not too squirrely, not too slippery. And we'll check out a YouTube video. This is Chrome, this is Jelly Bean. There is no flash player for those, so we're going to watch HTML5 video. And I, I really don't feel too bad about that, to be honest, because it's a lot more responsive than Adobe Flash Player. Of course, that won't get you anywhere if there's some content that's only available with Flash. This is Lisa from Mobile Tech. We're going to today we're looking at the HTC Plays just fine. Cool you can hear it at maximum volume one just one fine, too. So I won't pick on the speaker too, too much. So not bad. Phone has a 2100 milliamp battery that's sealed inside, and that's a competitive size battery compared to the Galaxy S3, the HTC One X, other high-end smartphones that are on the market. And without power-hungry LTE, you figure your own battery life's going to be pretty good, though HSPA Plus can actually be a little bit hungry on the battery too. That said, battery life for me has not been that good so far. And I've actually tried hard re resetting it once. It does make it through the day, but it makes it through the day barely, where some of my other phones, like the HTC One X, actually easily make it through the day, and my Lumia and my iPhone do the same. My Galaxy S3 can be a little bit piggish, too, on battery. I'll, I'll give you that. But those are running on LTE as well, so it will make it through the day. You're probably not going to get a day and a half, though, if you're a moderate to heavier than moderate user with the phone. Now, in synthetic benchmark scores on Quadrant, it scored 49.28, which is about the same that we see with Qualcomm S4 dual-core CPUs on things like the Samsung Galaxy S3, HTC One X, those kind of phones, so surprisingly low. In comparison, the Optimus G managed a 72.35, so we're not sure what's up there with the synthetic benchmarks right now. The phone feels perfectly fast, but then again, all these phones are so fast that it's really, it's hard to say that how, how fast they're going because they do things faster than we can do them at this point. It's really more up to the optimization of the software and things like, well, Google's Project Butter do help to try to speed up the UI animations, all the things that make you feel like a phone is fast. On Antutu, it scored 10,016, which is about 1,000 points lower than the Optimus G. On GL Benchmark 2.5, the Egypt 2.1 Classic Test, it scored 65th and 72 frames per second off screen. And you already saw that Sun Spider result that was 1854. So how about if we do something like throw gaming in? We're going to go with our usual dead trigger because it's pretty demanding 3D game and see how it does.
So here we are inside the dead trigger right now. By the way, the phone on the back, on this side here, gets quite warm. We we just only started up this game, and you'll feel the heat coming through the glass. Since this isn't a Tega 3, it doesn't have the Tega 3 optimization, so you're not getting the water that would be on the ground over here on a Tegra 3 device. It's playing just fine though, no frame rate drops, no problems there. All in all, it plays very smoothly. You, you know, the glass over here actually gets hot on the front, too, though. Something to keep in mind if you play a lot of games. It's really pretty, pretty darn warm. You'll feel it. So that's Dead Trigger on the Nexus 4. And since we are running Jelly Bean here, we get the neat widget that shows us a compendium of all of our content that we have on Google Play Music, Google Videos, and Magazines. We'll take a look at Magazines. Really kind of a small screen, even at 4.7 inches. I like a 10-inch screen for looking at magazines, but it does a nice job. Very Zinio-like style of rendering here. Beautiful looking, certainly. It's so sharp. Lots of happy models. And if you want to read something, you definitely want to either choose Reading View or Zoom in to actually read the text on it. So it's there, but again, it's a little bit teeny unless it's really pretty much just photo essays that you're looking at. And speaking of ebooks, obviously ebooks are more optimized to the size of the screen and really nice sharp screen, they look good. Now you can put Nook or Kindle or anything that you want in here, but we're just using Google Play Store right now. Page turn speed is certainly good. Still downloading the book. Text is nice and sharp. Let's get to a full text page. There we go. Very nice to read on. And the white is pretty much a nice, accurate white. Maybe a teeny bit cold, but overall, very nice, very pleasing, very easy on the eyes as far as LCDs go. No color casts, no, no flickering, no nothing like that. And really, really sharp text. So nice for e-reading too. So the Nexus 4 has a lot to offer, but again, especially for you folks who are outside of the U.S., because the lack of LTE, unless you really don't use your data connection much, would be probably be unusual for a lot of folks these days with a smartphone, uh, the, the data speeds on, on AT&T are going to seem a little bit disappointing once you've gotten used to LTE, if your previous phone had that. And if you're on T-Mobile, it's going to be gangbusters good. It's going to be everything that you're used to. Certainly for the price, $299 to $349 with no contract required, boy, it's a lot of fun for the money. Fast CPU, even if it's not benchmarking quite as fast as the Optimus G and the HEC Droid DNA yet. A very clean implementation of Android and nice new usability tweaks that we've showed you that, that make vanilla Android, to my mind, more pleasant to use and a lot closer to the stuff that Samsung and HTC does to, to try to make things easier on the user. So that's the Google Nexus 4 by LG. It's available now, although Google's having trouble keeping it in stock, so it's back ordered, but sooner or later you'll be able to get it. Again, a, a nice phone for GSM networks, particularly for you people overseas, because here in the US, well, the lack of LTE is kind of a pain point, unless you're on T-Mobile, where well, you don't have LTE anyway. Otherwise, a powerful phone at a great price, pure Google experience, not bad. Be sure to visit Mobile Tech Review to read our full review, and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel.